Well, good morning and welcome to this gathering of City Light Church. You know, uh, Easter Sunday was two weeks ago, but listen to what Bible scholar Tony Morita says about every Sunday when Christians gather. He writes, every Sunday, in a sense, is Easter Sunday for Christians. We gather to remind ourselves of the glorious fact that the tomb is empty and the throne is occupied. We remind ourselves of our living hope in our living Savior. Isn't that great? Easter may be over, but every Sunday for believers in Christ is like Easter Sunday. If you're able, would you please stand? And I wanted to read the scripture passage that Tony Morita is alluding to in the quote we just read. This is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. And listen to what Peter says about the resurrection of Jesus. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So if you're able, please stand and let's sing now of Jesus, the King of Kings, who humbled himself for our salvation and now reigns in glory at God's right hand. And let's approach him this morning with joy, with reverence, and with awe.
and we just sang a song about Jesus. He is the King of Kings. He is worthy of all of our praise. But as believers in Christ, we want to be people who come and honestly acknowledge the times and the places where we fall short of the glory of God. Confession of sin is just being honest with God about our sin so that we can freely receive anew the cleansing power of Christ's blood by grace and grace alone. So let's confess our sins together now using the words on the screen. Let's pray. Oh God, you are a holy God. You are utterly pure and separated from sin. There is no one like you. But we, though new creations in Christ, are a people of unclean lips and unclean hearts. Apart from your blood of Jesus, we could never stand in your presence. But now, because of your promise, we boldly come before your throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. We confess before you the thoughts, words, and deeds that make us unclean and separate us from you. Let's confess our sins silently together. Thank you for the gift of your son who has made us clean by his blood. Thank you that in him we are considered saints, holy ones of God. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit who dwells within us and renews us. Grant us to walk in the newness of life and be holy as you are holy through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear this word of assurance from the prophet Micah chapter 7. He says, who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Amen. Let's continue in worship.
Christ would offer his only son Who else invites me to call him father Only a holy By the grace that is in the Lord Jesus Christ, the holy God's throne of judgment has been transformed for us into a throne of grace. Praise be to God. You may be seated. This past Sunday at City Light Church, we had the privilege of baptizing 11 uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. You'll be seeing their pictures on the screen behind me. It was an outrageously joyful celebration. Uh, Describing baptism, Romans chapter 6 says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Baptism is incredibly significant. It is the Jesus-prescribed way that we go public with our faith in Jesus as the Lord and our Lord. When someone goes under the waters of baptism, it's a sign that the old them that was defined by sin is dead and gone because Christ died for them. As they come up from the waters of baptism, it's a sign that they have been raised to newness of life through Jesus who is resurrected on their behalf. Baptism is massive. And for that reason, the devil hates baptism. He hates when people go public calling upon Jesus Christ as Lord, displaying their newness of life in him. So now during this time, our time that is typically our pastoral prayer, we're going to pray. We're gonna pray first for the 11 folks who were baptized, and then we're going to pray that our Father will draw more people from death to new life in Christ and be baptized. So to prepare our hearts to pray, will you close your eyes and bow your heads with me? I wanna first invite you right where you are to quietly Pray for the 11 people who were baptized. Pray that they will be empowered by the Holy Spirit to walk in the newness of life that was professed at their baptism. And pray for them in every way that the Father puts on your heart. Go ahead, quietly pray for them right where you are. Father, we pray for our 11 brothers and sisters in Christ that were baptized last Sunday. Please fill them with your Holy Spirit so that they walk near to you and far from sin. Please guard them from the evil one, his schemes, his lies, and his accusations so that your joy, the joy of the Lord, will be their strength and they walk in the newness of life that is theirs in Christ. Friends, let's take a moment now right where you are to pray that our Father will draw more and more people from death to new life in Christ and that they'll be baptized. Pray for that to happen here across our city through every gospel preaching church and in New York City where City Light is planting our next church. Go ahead and pray right where you are.
Pray for that neighbor, that coworker, that classmate that you want to see come to faith in Jesus. If you're not yet a follower of Christ, what do you risk? Pray for yourself. Father, our heart's desire and prayer for the people of Philadelphia is that you will draw them sovereignly from death to new life in Jesus. And since faith comes through hearing and hearing the word of the gospel, help it to be upon our lips. Help us to pray and to love and to speak the good news of Christ. And we pray that you will draw many to faith in him, that they would be baptized. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, Near the end of Paul's letter to the Romans, he actually commands Christians to welcome one another as Christ has welcomed us for the glory of God. And so I want to invite you to stand and to greet one another with the warmth of Christ this morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're so glad that you joined um, us this morning for worship. My name is Allie, and I'm a covenant member here at City Light. And what a beautiful day the Lord has made for us to be um, together as a body, uh, worshiping him. Uh, If you are new to City Light, we uh, exist to make disciples of Jesus to the glory of God. And we do that through worship, which is love for God, community, which is love for each other, and mission, which is love for our neighbor, as we just prayed. And um, so if you are, are new here or you want to learn how to make City Light your church home, the best and easiest way for you to do that is to just fill out this connect card you might have sat on, put your name and your email on it, and drop it in the, the matching colored orange box in the back there as you leave. And someone will be in touch with you in the next day or so to get you some more info and help you to consider making City Light your church home. And if you do call City Light your church home, we invite you to give joyfully, regularly, and sacrificially as an act of worship. Um, We give generously because of the generosity that God has first shown us through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so every gift that you give to City Light goes towards that ministry of making disciples of Jesus to the glory of God. You can give by dropping um, your physical gifts off in the orange box there or by giving using one of the options on the screen behind me. And now is the time in our service when we turn our attention to God's word. Today we will be in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 through 29. It's on page 949 in that black Bible under your seat or near you. If you don't own a Bible, please uh, take this as our gift to you. Again, we're in Hebrews 12, verses 18 through 29. If you are able, will you please stand to honor the reading of God's word? For you have come not to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given, If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, 
For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. This is God's word. You may be seated. Thanks, Sally. Take a moment right where you are, and I want to invite you to prayerfully ask God to speak to you through his word. Whether you arrive this morning believing that the Bible is God's word or just checking this whole Christianity thing out, would you take a moment and ask God to speak to you? Father, as we come to the Bible, the book that followers of Jesus believe you wrote, our heart's desire and prayer is that by your inerrant word, through the power of your Holy Spirit, you will speak to each and every one of us right where we are, that you will lift up Jesus Christ, that you'll fix our eyes on him, and that we will increasingly become a church that looks more like him. Father, I also pray for myself that as I preach your word that you'll guard me from error, that you'll preach through me a way better sermon than the one I've got prepared. And I pray now that all that is of me will fall to the floor, all that is of your word will go forth into our hearts. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Last week, I shared with you about the exactly one marathon that I've run in my life. And I shared with you that it was a trail marathon that I was woefully underprepared for. And I also shared with you about the aid station at mile 20. The aid station at mile 20 that the race organizers foolishly placed right next to the parking lot where we left our cars, increasing the temptation to drop out and not run the race to the finish. But what I didn't tell you about last week was perhaps the primary factor that kept me running past mile 20 all the way to the finish. And that factor uh, is my wife, Andrea. Andrea was at the mile 20 aid station when I arrived. And when I got to mile 20, I was in a dark place. My legs were not prepared for the thousands of feet of elevation change. So I'm sitting there in a lawn chair, sipping some Gatorade, trying to ignore my car, just kind of compose myself to run the race to the finish. And Andrea was able to interpret the situation with a whole lot more wisdom than I could. She could tell that the lawn chair that I felt was so comfortable was actually a trap. And that if I stayed in it, it would devastate my desire to run the race to the finish. So you know what my dear wife did? She warned me. She warned me. She warned me, I know that you're in pain, get up. She warned me, I know that that chair feels comfortable. If you stay too long, I don't think you're ever going to finish this race. She warned me, get up, get going, keep running. She warned me. And the Christian life is a lot like an endurance race. It's an endurance race on the narrow path of faith in Jesus. And while the entire race of the Christian life can be joyful and exhilarating, the true joy is finishing and being welcomed into the eternal joy of our master, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. The problem is the race of faith is full of mile 20 like moments. The race of faith is full of dark moments, trying moments, tempting moments, and they all conspire together to get us to slow down first to coast on the race of faith, then to begin setting it out, which eventually leads us to drop out of the race of faith altogether, proving that we were never really runners in the first place. 
I wonder what's distracting and tempting you to slow down in the race of faith. Well, like my experience with Andrea, God's warning makes all the difference. Because God's warnings are effective. God warns his people because he loves his people. And his warnings are the means by which he keeps us running. God warns us because he loves us. And we've received a lot of warnings throughout Hebrews. Hebrews is a one long sermon with a whole lot of warnings. And God's warnings are his loving means that keep us running. And this morning we come to the final warning of the letter to the Hebrews, and we find it in verse 25. It's the heart of our passage. It says, See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns us from heaven. And that brings us to the big idea of our passage this morning. The final warning in Hebrews, do not refuse him who is speaking. Do not refuse him who is speaking. See to it. Now, this warning is just like the warnings we've received all throughout Hebrews. To put it positively, the warning is keep running the race of faith with endurance to the end. Don't coast, don't sit down, don't drop out. Run the race of faith with endurance to the end and you will be welcomed into the eternal joy of your master, but drop out and you will prove that you were never a runner and you will experience nothing but God's judgment forever. Run the race of faith with endurance. In other words, do not refuse him who is speaking. And like Andrea with me, God's warning can make all the difference. His warning is here to keep us running. And now in our passage, we find three incredibly encouraging reasons why we do not refuse him who is speaking. Reason one, because you've come to a greater mountain. Do not refuse him who is speaking first because you've come to a greater mountain. Second, do not refuse him who is speaking because you've heard a greater warning. You've heard a greater warning. And then third and finally, do not refuse him who is speaking because you've received a greater kingdom. A greater kingdom. So first, do not refuse him who is speaking because you've come to a greater mountain. So our passage begins with this interesting contrast between two mountains, Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. And the point is, do not refuse him who is speaking. Don't coast continue to run the race of faith in Jesus with endurance to the end because you've already come not to Sinai, but to Zion. You've come to a greater mountain. Now, hmm. You ever come into the middle of a movie and wonder, what's happening in the story? What's the point of this scene? We can have this experience a lot with the Bible, can't we? The Bible is one unified story from Genesis to Revelation, but if you pop in in the middle, sometimes you're wondering, Sinai? Zion? Never even heard of these mountains. Where do these situate into the story? And what exactly is the point? Well, let's get the backstory. In the Old Testament, when God, the one true God, the Lord, brought his people out of slavery in Egypt, when he brought Israel the Abrahamic descendants, out of slavery in Egypt, through the Red Sea on dry ground, before he made a covenant with them, we'll get to that in a moment, he brought them to a special place. He brought them to Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, he entered into a covenant with Israel. We know it as the old covenant. Now, a covenant is a chosen relationship in which two parties make binding promises to one another. And there are usually blessings associated with keeping your side of the covenant and curses associated with breaking it. The closest example we have to this is a marriage. And when the Lord established his covenant relationship with his Old Testament people, Israel, he brought them to a special place, sort of a special location for their marriage ceremony. 
he brought them to Mount Sinai. And boy, did that location match the covenant. Because it was scary. It was terrifying. And access to God's presence was denied at Sinai. The location matched the covenant. We read about it beginning in verse 18. Let's look again. Notice what it says. For you have not come to what may be touched. So Mount Sinai is a literal mountain in the Middle East. You can touch it. I rode up it one time on a camel. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest. So he's now describing what the mountain was like when Israel approached it, when God brought them there to make his covenant with them. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them for they could not endure the order that was given. Here's the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. So Mount Sinai was an earthly mountain and it could be touched. And when God's people approached Mount Sinai, it was covered with a storm and gloom, which represented God's might and his power there at the mountain. And smoke was rising up, you know, from the mountain, and it was shaking with a mighty earthquake. And the earthquake and the fire and the darkness and the gloom and the tempest, it all communicated that God's terrible, manifest, glorious presence had descended on the mountain. And the people let alone the animals, if they even approached it to touch it, would be stoned and killed because God is holy and they are not. And even Moses trembled with fear. Now, why is the author of Hebrews bringing all this up? Because the location, Mount Sinai, matched the Old Covenant. The location matched the covenant. You see, Old Testament believers could not draw near to God through the old covenant that was established at Mount Sinai. No, they looked ahead to a new covenant. The old covenant and Mount Sinai were terrifying and access was denied. But the old covenant was never meant to be permanent. It was always preparatory. It was preparatory for a new mountain that would be a new covenant with a new people. And you've come to a greater mountain. You've come not to Mount Sinai. You've come to a greater mountain. You've come to Mount Zion. And as one New Testament scholar says, the difference between Sinai and Zion is the difference between paralyzing fear and extraordinary joy. It's the difference between distance and nearness. In the Bible, Zion is closely associated with the heavenly Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. So you remember I said that the Bible is one long story from Genesis to Revelation? Well, at the end in Revelation, Thomas, I'm talking here, my man. It's cool. He's like my best bud. Don't you dare take him out. All right. When you get to the end of the Bible, what you see is our blessed hope is a new mountain, a new creation, new heavens, new earth, and the capital of it is New Jerusalem. Every follower of Jesus will be there and God himself will be with them as our God and he will wipe away our every tear. All the sighing, all the sadness, all the sin, all the dark moments will be gone forever and we will be welcomed to a new mountain, to Mount Zion. But the author of Hebrews says, you know what? If you've believed in Jesus, you're already there. If you've come to Jesus by faith, you're already at Mount Zion. Not physically, of course, that's not yet, but you're already there spiritually. You've come to a greater mountain. Listen to what it's like. Picking it up in verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering. In other words, they're having a fantastic time. Heaven will not be boring, not for a moment and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, that is, the followers of Jesus from years and millennia of old, are there. We've already come. And to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, 
and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Oh my goodness, why would we want to refuse that voice? Why would we ever want to turn back from running the race of faith, listening to the voice of him who speaks from heaven? Why wouldn't we want to run the race of faith with endurance to the very end? We've already come to Mount Zion. As Ephesians says, we're already seated with Christ in the heavenly places if we believe in him. If you've believed in Jesus Christ, then you've already come to Zion. You're already seated in heaven. And every time we gather for worship down here, we're participating in the festal gathering of the saints that's going on in heaven all of the time. We're already there and we've already come to God. Through the one mediator, Jesus Christ, whose blood was spilled on the cross to forgive our sins and to bring us to God, God who was once our judge is now our father. We've already come to him. His throne of judgment has been made into a throne of grace and we are already welcomed there. The blood of Abel in the Old Testament, it was an example of faith. The blood of Jesus Christ is what secures our faith so that we are now brought to Zion, brought to God. Why would we ever turn back? Do not refuse him who is speaking because you've already come to a greater mountain. You know, I said, why would we ever turn back? I'll tell you why we'd turn back. Because you notice Mount Sinai can be touched. The reason why we're tempted to slow down to coast, to turn back, is because we're tempted to build our lives around things that we can touch. I wonder what things that you can touch are you tempted right now to build your entire life around? That kind of relationship to something, building your entire life around it, there are many ways you can describe it, but one of them is worship. That good thing has become a God thing. It's become a bad thing. It's an idol. But we can touch it. But don't turn back for that. Don't turn back for that which can be touched. Instead, Run the race of faith with endurance. Do not refuse him who is speaking first because you've already come to Zion. You've already come to a greater mountain. Now second, do not refuse him who is speaking second because you've heard a greater warning. You've come to a greater mountain, but secondly, you've heard a greater warning. Verse 25. See to it, this is our big idea again, that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. Notice that. Warn them on earth. That's a reference to Sinai again. Remember I said a moment ago that when God brought his people out of slavery in Egypt and brought them to Mount Sinai, he entered into a covenant with them. And remember, a covenant involves blessing if you keep it. Curses if you don't. Curses if you break that first commandment and go after other gods. But I want to read to you a list of some of the curses that God promised would come upon his old covenant people if they went after other gods. And I want you to see if you notice what all these curses have in common. You ready for the list? Disease, confusion, frustration, crops that fail, drought, defeat before your enemies, exile from your land. Do you notice what all those curses have in common? They're all earthly and temporary. They're earthly, and they're temporary. They only point to something eternal. And friends, God's people did not escape them. They did turn and go after other gods, and they did experience disease and devastation and exile out of the land. They did not escape. How much less will we escape if we refuse the voice of him who sent his son to live the righteous life that we failed to live on our behalf. 
How much less are we going to escape if we refuse the voice of him who crucified his son in our place for our sins? How much less will we escape if we refuse the voice of him who raised his son to give us eternal life and has seated him at his right hand? We will not escape, so don't turn back. Do not refuse the God who is speaking who sent his son for you. Instead, keep running the race of faith with endurance because if they didn't escape and they were merely warned from earth, how much less are we going to escape being warned from heaven? We won't. Run the race of faith with endurance. Keep following Jesus. Keep repenting of sin. Keep clinging to him. He's holding on to you. Do not refuse him who is speaking you've received a greater warning. Now, as an aside, this verse really does blow up that false and heretical idea that the Old Testament God was somehow different than the New Testament God and more severe, but the New Testament God is different and more merciful. Doesn't this verse just blow up that idea? Because right here, what we're seeing is they received Warning from earth. We, New Testament believers, are receiving warning from heaven. A far more severe and eternal warning. Do not refuse him who is speaking. Keep trusting in Jesus. Keep walking by faith. Don't give up, no matter what kind of dark moment you're in. Do not refuse him who is speaking. First, because we've come to a greater mountain. Second, because we've heard a greater warning. And finally because you've received a greater kingdom. Do not refuse him who is speaking because you've received a greater kingdom. A kingdom that cannot be shaken. Remember, Sinai shook at God's voice of warning. Well, according to our passage, there's another shaking that's coming. We see it in verse 26. It says, at that time, His voice shook the earth. So that was at Sinai, the warning, God's voice. It shook the earth. But now he has promised, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Now that's a quote from the prophet Haggai. And the prophet Haggai is saying, yeah, the earth shook back then. But not only the earth, the heavens are going to shake again one day. That is a reference to the final judgment that will come before God's people, believers in Jesus, are welcomed to Mount Sinai. Verse 27 clarifies the point. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. Well, what what things are going to be shaken? What things are going to be removed? That is, things that have been made. Friends, everything that is part of just this present creation, everything that is imperfect and temporary, everything that is fallen is going to be shaken and it will be gone, and as this verse says, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. All that is part of this present creation, everything that is imperfect and fallen is going to be shaken and fall away so that that which is eternal, that which cannot be shaken, will remain. I mean, what a relief. What a relief. All the stuff that we spend so much time fretting over, all of the stuff that we spend most of our life obsessing about, our problems, our health problems, our home problems, our career problems, it's going to be shaken and it'll be gone. That doesn't mean they don't matter. It just means don't be overly consumed by them. Don't let fear about them control you. Don't wrap your life around them like they're everything. It's going to be shaken. So be properly concerned, but not controlled by anxiety. You know, Pastor Mike at City Light Center City, one of my dear friends, he owns a row home in the city. And I have too. And if you've ever owned one of these 200-year-old row homes in the city of Philadelphia, then you know it's just one problem after another. It's cool. It's worth it. It's great. But they're 200 years old. You're always going to be fixing stuff. 
And he and his wife have gotten, tried to get into this habit, you know, when they have to pay like another $500 to fix another problem of looking at each other and saying, hey, but let's remember, it's all gonna be shaken. Hey, let, let, let's remember, this is important, this matters, but let's not be consumed by it. It's all gonna be shaken. It's all coming down so that what is eternal may remain. Now, I, I think this actually raises a really practical question that we all have to consider. What are we going to do with all of our time? Like, if now we've received a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and therefore everything that's shaky in this world, everything that usually consumes all of our thoughts, everything that usually consumes our time, I mean, think about the minutes and the hours every day that we spend fretting, worrying, and entertaining worst possible scenarios. If we're done with that, properly concerned, yes, but not controlled by anxiety, no, not that, what are we going to do with all of our time? According to our passage, what we're going to do with all of our time is we're going to be grateful. And in our angry, freaked out world, a community of hundreds of people that are grateful for a kingdom that cannot be shaken will make the real Jesus non-ignorable. We're going to be grateful. And then we're going to offer God acceptable worship. Verses 28 and 29. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Just spend that time being grateful. Okay, we, we could freak out about this. Let's figure out how we're gonna solve it and then let's just spend all, all of our time being grateful. I'm grateful too, yes. Grateful, it's grateful. And then we offer God acceptable worship. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken and let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Now, you might be thinking, now, what's that little word acceptable doing in there? Can't I worship God in any way I please? Why does it say acceptable worship? I, I don't know about you. Do you sometimes get the idea that God's just so desperate for our worship that he'll kind of take anything? He's so desperate for our worship, he'll take anything we offer. No problem. Well, friends, God's happy, so he's not desperate. And God is holy, so we don't only worship the right God, we have to worship the right God in the right way. Acceptable worship is that worship which is prescribed in the Bible. So when we get together, we ought to be worshiping in an acceptable way, in that way that the Bible prescribes, singing songs, reading scripture, praying prayers, sermon, the sacraments. And when we meet with God privately throughout the week for worship, we should be worshiping in ways he's prescribed. He's holy. We have to worship the right God in the right way. That's acceptable worship. But you notice in our passage, there's actually something even more specific. Notice what it says in verse 28 near the end. Let us offer to God acceptable worship. Now, what is that? With reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. That is, he is a jealous God. Our God is scary. Anyone who can create everything out of nothing with the word is frightening. I mean, just think about the expanse of space. Space is scary. I mean, you think about it for a few minutes, you'll be terrified. However, an astronaut can enjoy space with reverence and awe rather than terror from the inside of the safety of a spacesuit. In the same way, when we believe into Jesus Christ, we are forever forgiven. His blood covers us, we are safe, and so the God who is a consuming fire, instead of being terrified of him, we can worship him with reverence and awe, because that's what's acceptable to him. If I can make it plain, it's simply not acceptable to God for us to stand up and mouth words we're not even thinking about because we're wondering what's coming next. It's just not acceptable to God that we, like, look, I, I like sports as much as the next person. Well, that's an exaggeration, but I like them fine. Um, and, you know, like when the Eagles are doing well, I scream and yell. It is not acceptable to God that, I know you're like, but I'm an introvert. I've seen you watch Eagles games. Okay, you, you have exuberance in you. It is not acceptable to God that when we stand to worship he who is a consuming fire, we mouth words we're hardly thinking about and we speak so quietly. He is holy. Just a whisper. Not acceptable. 
Our God is a consuming fire, and yet we're safe with him because we're covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we offer him acceptable worship, minds consumed with reverence, hearts consumed with awe, words that are loud and reflect that he is a consuming fire. A warning really can make all the difference. A warning can make all the difference. You know, my one marathon was difficult. I was very underprepared for all of the elevation change. And I was in a ton of pain at mile 20, but Andrea was there watching me in the lawn chair, warning me. And the warning made all the difference. Friends, God has warned us. He has warned us. Do not refuse my voice. Keep running the race of faith with endurance to the end. Don't turn to the left or to the right. Do not give up because through Jesus, you've already come to a greater mountain and you have already received a greater warning and you have a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Do not refuse him who is speaking. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads with me? I want to give you right where you are one minute of personal response time. <clears throat> if you're a follower of Jesus, this just simply may be a time to confess ways that you're coasting and ask God to give you grace to not refuse his voice, but to keep walking by faith, to cling to Christ because you have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, you're not trusting in him as your only hope in life and in death. During this minute of quiet response, I want to turn your attention to the connect card. At the bottom of it is a sample prayer that can help give you language to turn from your sins and to trust in Jesus as your only savior, becoming his follower for the first time. Friend, I do want to warn you. If you refuse him who warns from heaven, eternal will be the curse. But if you will receive his voice, his good news, that all of your sins can be forgiven by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus alone, then you will be safe in Christ. Take a minute right where you are to talk to God, and then we'll stand and worship. Father, we've heard your word. We pray that everything that is of your word that you will give us hearts to believe it, strength to obey it, and joy to absolutely love it. And as we come now to remember your son crucified and risen through taking the Lord's Supper, strengthen our faith in him so that we can run with endurance. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this time, the communion elements are going to be passed out before we stand to sing songs of worship. If you've repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus, then please grab the communion elements as they go by and hold on to them. We'll take them all together. If you're here this morning, you're saying, I still, I'm still not ready to heed his voice, then I'd ask that you not participate in the Lord's Supper. Just let those communion elements pass you by. But we're so thankful you're here. Please come back next week. Continue your journey with City Light. As the communion elements are being passed out, I want to read to you from 1 Corinthians 11 the significance of what we're about to do together. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The Lord's Supper is a memorial, a meal by which we remember Jesus' body broken and his blood shed at the cross to bring us to God, to Zion, to an unshakable kingdom. And so we'll begin with the bread element. The bread symbolizes Jesus' body, which was broken for us at the cross. He was broken under God's judgment so that we who deserve judgment can be forgiven and free and run the race of faith with endurance to the end. Let's eat in remembrance of him. At the cross, Jesus shed his blood. He, the righteous one, for us, the unrighteous, to bring us to God forever as adopted sons and daughters. Let's drink in remembrance of him. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Uh, During these next three songs of worship, if there's anything going on in your life that you'd like prayer for, anything at all, there'll be folks on the back under the prayer signs, they'd love to pray with you. They'll be up at the front after the service is over, they'd love to receive you for prayer then. And if the Lord puts a spontaneous word of prophetic encouragement on your heart and you're a member of City Light Church, please come to the front and share it with me. I'll weigh it according to scripture and then we'll communicate it as appropriate. So let's stand and we're gonna worship our God now with reverence and awe because he is a consuming fire. Great. 
Next song I'm going to do is a new one for us. It's called My King Forever. It's a really simple chorus. I think you guys will pick it up pretty quick. But we're going to begin with the chorus so you can hear it a few times before we sing it through. All praise to the Lord Most High. All praise to the one who saved my life. All praise to Jesus Christ. I, King of heaven, my King forever. All praise to the Lord Most High. All praise to the one who saved my life. All praise to Jesus Christ. I, King of heaven, my King forever.
Christ, High King of heaven, my King forever. As we started worship, um, Hebrews 4 came to mind. Um, in verses 6 and 7, it says, Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news fail to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day. Today, saying through David, so long afterward, in the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. What he's talking about here is, you know, finishing the race. And kind of the, the Lord put on my mind that oftentimes when we hear a warning, we can either choose to resist it and grow bitter towards it, or we can choose to soften our hearts to what the Lord is trying to say. And so today, as Hebrews says, I would encourage you to soften your heart towards the warning that the Lord is giving you to run the race and to finish it well. Let us worship him in reverence and awe because we have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken.
Victoria. benediction just a quick reminder if you fill out this connect card to drop it in the orange box in the back we'll be in touch with you tomorrow to help you find a home at city light now receive as your benediction these words at the close of hebrews 13 now may the god of peace who brought you again from the dead our lord jesus who brought again from the dead our lord jesus the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant equip you with everything good that you may do as well, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen? Amen. Go in peace.